We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Antry, and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And I guess we'll say uh, congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs winning the Super Bowl. That happened. And watch. Happy watch. Valentine's Day. We're recording on Valentine's Day. So, uh, so love is in the air, I guess. I don't know. I'm still single. So what would I know about Valentine's Day? Uh, but there we go. And we'll see how long this podcast episode ends up lasting because tom's having some internet troubles and it's not on my end we know that this time i don't know this what's time going we know on. It's on i think tom's my end. modem is crapping out on ah. me and it's uh there's really nothing i can do about it right not, now i've not tried everything second, no. yeah i've tried everything it's the only thing that seems the internet goes down uh-huh. and the pr- provider says that i still have it <laughs> <laughs> it's Great. And I'm like, well, my modem seems to disagree with you and everything uh-huh. else is working. So I I, it's, I mean, I have no reason to believe. I mean, I go up there. It says I go up there because I have my modem up high on top okay. of my kitchen okay. um, on top of some cabinets. So I go up there. I look at it. It says online. Uh-huh. And then I reset the modem and then suddenly I get internet back. Right. So I don't know. Yeah. So we'll see. Like you just disappeared from the shared Google Doc on my end, so I don't know if you're still able to see it. But that's I I I, I don't seem to have internet right now. I don't know how this call is still <laughs> how this going Skype on. call is functioning because we are seeing and hearing each other, and Tom's video is actually perfectly fine at this moment, as evidence that you can see on the YouTube video if it comes out this week. So whatever, it's going to be a fun technical mess. Uh, we'll we'll just cross our fingers that we find a way to make it through this. Uh, but there we go. Yeah, Tom's got lots of things on what he watched this week. So uh, yes. Yeah, so I had COVID you. last week, right. so that was I, I thought I had a cold. Oh yeah, we didn't inform the listeners of that, did we? That no. was just between you and I. <laughs> I thought I had a cold. I was sure of it. I was so sure of it that I didn't take really any precautions, right? Like I normally would have if I thought if I had any inkling because I didn't have any of the normal symptoms. I mm. wasn't. My throat didn't hurt. Uh-huh. I didn't have a. I didn't really didn't have that much of a cough. I you was just, just I felt had a runny nose. Unwell had, last week, clearly. Yeah, so. I, and I had a runny nose, right. and I I started sneezing and whatever. Not sneezing, but you know, I had a runny nose. Congestion. So yes, by Wednesday I was like, I'm sick, mm. and uh, so but I just had a, I started getting a little bit of a fever, mm-hmm. and I was like, my wife's like, yeah, it doesn't sound like you have COVID. I'm like, I know, <laughs> but. I'm like, I'll take a test tomorrow. Yeah. But I ended up taking a test that night. Mm. And I did. And I was like, it wasn't just like, because you have like the two little lines. Yes, you do. One for the control, one for the whether or not. The the line for whether or not you have it almost gl- like glowed red. Yeah, <laughs> it was right. like, you okay. have all of the COVID. I was like, <laughs> crap. So I quarantined in the house and everything like you're supposed to. Mm-hmm. And uh, so far, my family hasn't gotten it. So that you know uh, of, <laughs> that, I mean, they, somebody might have it and just be very lightly or asymptomatic. Right. That, as far as I know, they don't have it. Yeah. And uh, like you said, they're either asymptomatic or they don't, they don't, they haven't developed symptoms yet. Yeah. But it's been over a week now since I started developing symptoms. They should have developed them by now, nah. but uh, if they were going to, but uh, yeah, I watched a lot of crap and this was worse for those of you that remember this is the second time i've had it right i have no idea where i got it i mean i live well, in florida I mean, but it could <laughs> it's, be anywhere it could be anywhere <laughs> could, could could have been in any of the and i've been to some live shows which have been in very big ah right places yes, sure. you know i mean I, i'm not i don't know could have been from anywhere yeah. so it could have been from the grocery store but um uh, Fortunately, so far, I haven't given it to anybody in my family. Uh, but this was worse. Uh, mm. I definitely, I wasn't that much sicker, if that makes much sense. You know, like mm. my, as far as like my fever and stuff sure. like that. But I was, I was just, I couldn't get out of bed for two days. For basically like two days, I was just lying mm. there, and I didn't. It, it, all the stuff I'm going to talk about, I watched. I watched in like the last. Like like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or maybe Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> While you were laid I watched, up, that's, that's I, what well, it's I was for. starting to feel better, but you right. know, was still staying away from everybody. And uh, but the first couple of days, I I mean I wasn't awake for more than 
like three minutes, like long enough to restart my right. YouTube video, whatever YouTube video that I that it had gone to next. I don't know what I absorbed yeah. <laughs> through my dreaming. Well, hopefully so you're on the start, mend. Yeah, I am. <laughs> okay. So what have you watched? Let's get that out of the way. Let me do that first. All right. Yeah, we, we will try not to spend too, too long on this because we do have a whole smattering of questions to get to. Uh, but I did want to talk about the movies that I watched. Uh, I'll start with Morgan. Uh, no, not to be confused with Megan, which just came oh, out recently. Oh, that's the horror movie, right? Megan is the horror movie. Megan so is the Morgan horror movie. Yeah. About uh, Morgan Freeman's life and story or something? It is like absolutely that? not. Morgan no, is a thriller uh, from 2016, uh, starring Anya Taylor Joy and um, one of the Mara sisters kate mara i think it is yeah i'm pretty sure it was kate mara who was in this one um yeah uh this was the directorial debut of luke scott which is ridley scott's son um so yeah uh, it had really quite poor reviews uh i looked up the reviews after i watched it i didn't mind this movie um now it's not like a fantastic movie um and what i found kind of intriguing about this is it is a movie that had problems in the script um the sort of problems where for a lot of this movie um so uh just the the basic premise here is that uh anya taylor joy's character is like an artificially created person um like uh, she's not made of just regular dna uh it's kind of like nanotechnology that was used to like create a life form that's that's basically what's going on and, uh, and there's an incident that goes on with her. And so Kate Mara's character is brought in to sort of oversee and do an evaluation and see whether this this artificially created person is allowed to continue living or not. That's, that's sort of the premise. So, yes, there are similarities to Ex Machina, for sure. Um, although uh, Anya Taylor-Joy is, is completely biological. She's not like a, a, a robot like uh, they okay. had in Ex Machina. Um, but the problem in the writing was, I, I was like, it was never clear in this movie until the end why they created her in the first place. Like, I guess you don't really need to totally know why they made her, but it was kind of a little bit like, what? why did they do this? <laughs> and then um, by the, once you get to the end and you figure, and you find out why they made her, then you work backwards and it's like, well, a lot of the stuff that of the scientists at this place, like, did they not know why they made her? Because it doesn't, really work anymore if you puzzle back the logic yeah. of what was going on so there, there were problems in the script from that point of view but in a way they didn't really bother me like it i found it almost intriguing to like watch this thing sort of work itself out on the screen as though you were working it out on the page and being like okay we we said this earlier on and that doesn't quite work anymore so we kind of have to either ignore it or work our way around it i just it was like a murder mystery but instead of trying to figure out the mystery you're trying to figure out how what mental gymnastics they're trying to go through to make the plot work there was a little bit of that and i can see why um you know if you went into it thinking that this was going to be like a straight thriller or a straight horror or a straight action or anything like that which i'm sure i don't remember a lot of the trailers but i'm sure the trailers made it look like a movie that this wasn't uh i can see going in and and like being a little bit frustrated that it wasn't any of those things i actually felt that this movie showed a lot of restraint um, that they didn't go overboard in any particular uh, uh, direction with it and and just played it pretty straight and and straightforward and people weren't overly stupid um, and and I, I I quite liked it to be honest um, yeah. so yeah that, that was Morgan I think it's worth checking out uh, if if you were put off by the bad reviews I don't think it deserves them now the other movie that I was much more excited about was Fresh uh, which just came out 2022 um, released uh, I saw it on Disney Plus I'm sure it's on Hulu in the States uh, this was another directorial debut um, and stars uh, Daisy Edgar Jones, who probably most people don't know. I knew her from the more recent War of the Worlds uh, television series, which is airing, which is like a very Walking Dead take on War of the Worlds, <laughs> very much follows that same formula. Uh, but Daisy Edgar Jones was sort of a standout in the first two seasons of that, um, uh, you know, got much better acting than everybody else in that series. And here uh, she's starring a lar- alongside Sebastian Stan, who uh, you would know as Winter Soldier. Um, sure. and, and the two of them, uh, they are better than this movie um and so you often find actors who you know elevate the material these two 
really elevate this movie. Now, I give this movie's writing and directing a lot of credit. They picked a tone. They they were confident in the tone that they were going for. It didn't feel like a di- directorial debut. Um, in, in terms of tone, a, a little bit of shades of like Get Out, um, you know, where again, this is sort of a horror thriller, but has those little bits of comedy and that uncomfortableness throughout yeah. everything. It's It's primarily uncomfortable and then quite a bit of like, humor that cuts through it as well um in similar ways like you have like the best friend character who, who's making the quips and and those type of things like you had in get out and very similar in fresh there's a character who, who does that as well um so i mean like is this the greatest thriller horror movie ever no again the the ending does the typical thriller horror movie thing where it's kind of hard to hold everything together right to the very end without something starting to feel a little bit silly and and yeah there are some very uh you know twitter critique type of things that make their way in there from the writer and and it's it's all a little bit heavy-handed at points but there is one scene in particular um, if you think back to when Anne Hathaway won her Oscar, and you can basically say that that was for a single scene in Les Miserables that she won that Oscar. It wasn't like okay. her character, you know, literally wasn't uh, in the movie for, for really that long of it. And, and she essentially won the Oscar for a single scene. Uh, Daisy Edgar Jones should win an Oscar for a single scene uh, in, in Fresh. Uh, there is one scene, uh, which is like, basically there's a really long prologue to this movie. And then when the movie, the thriller part of this movie really begins, there's a scene right there uh, where they just keep the camera right up close, uh, Daisy Edgar Jones, and you see every thought and every progression of thought go through her face and her body and and the few words that squeak out of her while this is going on and it was fantastic that, that like i i don't have enough praise for that single scene and, and what she did in that scene uh it, it was like it was just perfect it was just perfect just watching you could just see every thought going through every a conflicting emotion that was going on and and questioning herself and blaming herself and 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 being in denial and like all of it just layered and layered and it was wonderful <laughs> just a wonderful performance so for that mm-hmm. scene alone uh, i highly recommend checking out fresh and and overall i thought it was a darn good movie so there you go two movies that that didn't get like a ton of praise i think were a-okay now, let's all remember how much Rob talked about two things when I talk about all the things I'm going to talk about, and let's not let's not complain about the amount of time I spend okay. talking about them. Uh, so, I was locked in a room for days, and I had already started watching a show called Lockwood & Co. Okay. Or Lockwood & Company, I guess. It's, yeah. They always say co, in the, because it's ah. in England. Uh, it feels like it's based on a comic book. I'm not really sure if it is or not. I don't really care. Or maybe a series of books. I don't know. Um, and, uh, it's a short series. Maybe it's got one, one season. I doubt it'll get another one cause it is on Netflix. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't superb. Uh, the premise is that, uh, there, the, there's ghosts, have, okay. you know, started rising up about a hundred years ago or so. And, um, if they touch you, you die ah. and children tend or children ha- are, have the ability to become sensitive to them and can, sure. Uh, sense them aware in of different the ways, like with different powers or whatever. And then, uh, but adults can't. And then, can't. as these children age, they lose their abilities. All right. And so that they use them as sort of these ghost hunter like ah. types who go in there and like they with a whatever. limited time span to when they're effective. Right. Uh, so that follows a female uh, protagonist who uh, joins Lockwood and Co., which is a child-led uh i guess they call them um agency that does this there's always supposed to be an adult overseer but this one doesn't have one because Uh plot uh (laughs) you know the it's okay like the the special effects are okay and Uh the 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 plot is like well they're children so they're kind of dumb okay. but then they they tried to kind of sh- shoehorn or sort of suggest that there's a love angle going on between the children ah. and that just gets kind of we- for me that just kind of gets weird mm. because you di- they never really say how old they are mm. and they never really say what adulthood means as far as you know these are obviously post progressive people oh okay you know and you know what i mean they're they're not they're not like 10 years old right but they're not adults, so where okay. are they? Like they're 16 teenagers. to 18 or okay. someplace in there? I mean, 12? I don't know. They look older than that, 
you know, they never really say where they are. So it always gets kind of a little bit like, like they needed to be a little bit for me. There needed to be a little bit more like definitive. Like they shouldn't have done that part of it, as far as I'm concerned. They should <laughs> okay. just left that alone. Uh, I mean, kids but, do uh, date in grade eight and grade nine and grade seven. They <laughs> do, happens. they do, but they're not all living in the house together uh-huh. and without any adults around, which is very strange. So, anyways, uh, the plot has a has a lot of that too stupid to live sort of situation going on where you're like really this is your your plan is every single plan is we're just going to go here and wing it i'm like okay you're gonna do a little bit better than that even the times when they're not going there just to wing it they still end up having to wing it which sort of suggests that maybe that adult oversight would have been helpful in their case (laughs) but it's okay if you're into that sort of it has a more uh less technological feel there are there's like there's a gun in the entire thing. And everything else is swords because of ghosts. Ah. Uh, but uh, it, uh, so it has a less technologically advanced feel to it. It's not which ghost sort of ghosts. makes sense if you think about, uh, you know, if ghosts started showing up, you would start change. Like society would fundamentally change to deal with this thing ah. rather than something else so okay uh, it was okay i mean i would give it a try it's not gonna get a second season i, don't think. Right. I can i can't yeah. imagine it is wouldn't count on uh, too I much f- at netflix and after i finished that i was like you know what i have a whole bunch of series that i have started right. and not finished let's just knock them all out okay. one at the other one at a time so i finished the last season of the expanse which only had six episodes which probably the weakest season but maybe not the total weakest but it's down there uh, okay for me that's but, amazon uh, prime amazon prime uh, again, one of the better, as far as like dis, uh, talking about uh, or or ex- exploring actual space travel and living right. in space and that sort of thing, one of the better, if not the best, sci-fi shows yeah. that are out there. Hire a science advisor and actually put some of the things they say into the script. Yes, uh, <laughs> they. This I, I seem to remember previous seasons where like anything shot outside like in space was dead silent mm-hmm. but this this seat and I, I haven't watched the other uh, seasons in a long time but this season definitely wasn't so oh. there was a little bit more huh. you know you could hear like engines going off and i i kind of forgive that because you know, at least in my mind they're like well you're seeing it from outside but the uh, the characters are experiencing it from inside and they're going to oh, okay yeah you know hear well, something if you were inside the ship you would hear things absolutely right but you're not seeing it from inside the ship you're seeing no. it from outside the okay. ship uh but yes uh they did tie everything up which was nice but then they also left it so that there could be more. there could be another season okay. yeah there could be more <laughs> there's definitely Prime things to be Netflix. done <laughs> uh then i finished andor yeah. which i guess i had stopped it essentially halfway through this the, the season oh and my. halfway th- and halfway through the season because i didn't realize there was 12 episodes yeah it, it, I swear they made that they started making this. And they're like, yeah, we're not getting too se- like we're not going to if like this doesn't have the sort of it's not going to have the sort of draw that uh, other things are. Let's just make the whole thing. <laughs> so okay. it seemed to me that it was split completely in half. So after the <laughs> well, they kind of did heist, like three episode arcs more or yeah. less. Yeah. So after the heist, uh, you know, is where I stopped. Oh, okay. You know, so, so right there. And I thought I was almost done, but I thought there were no, like two no. episodes left and there was like six. Yeah. So, uh, finish that off. Um, I, <laughs> and we got to remember, I'm watching so much TV back to back at this yeah. point. <laughs> that oh, that's I'm starting funny because get... I was expecting you to love this. And yeah. It, well, I mean, I, I'm reading your facial I didn't expression. not like it. Yeah. It's yeah. just that I really kind of wanted to see a little, like the character development and the end of this. I, I definitely wanted to see that choice that he has to make at sure. the end. Uh, I wanted to see him ha- see both sides of it, if that makes sense. Hmm. Uh, I'm trying not to give anything away yeah. for those of you that haven't seen it, but he has, there's like two options of, or you can maybe argue three, but there's definitely two, two things that are happening around him where he, it could have been more, uh, explicitly shown to the character. Like if you go, if you make this choice, ah. this is almost certainly what's going to happen. You make this choice. This is what's going to happen to but you. But the whole and- series is about air shades of gray and not yes. knowing what's going to happen so i feel thematically it made sense i um but i liked it and yeah. I, I, I like him as a character even more like i really didn't love him in, in uh in uh, rogue one 
Right. And but he was I a supporting go, character in that. And, now he's and the lead. now I want to go back and watch it again and, yeah. and and see some more of it. So it was definitely interesting. The shades of gray aspect, uh these following the lives of not just the rebels, but also yeah. lives of some of the Empire yeah. and seeing how the internal workings of the Empire is certainly the most interesting part of what's going this on. This was like, in- I think, maybe the first Star Wars thing I could see that you could remove all the Star Wars from it and still make a show. That was this yes. show. Yes. And there's almost no... Um, there's almost no callback to other, even in the, the slight bits of callback that there are there to uh, to other Star Wars stuff. Like you said... You don't need to know that you it know, didn't the, have to be Star Wars. This wasn't Star yes. Wars is not the only universe where you could have told this story. Yeah, so, I, li- I, liked, I very yeah. I liked it so as lot. far as the shades of gray and everything, I did like it quite yeah. a bit. Uh, I did Rings of Power, wow. and at this point, I'm getting very tired. No kidding, <laughs> so that, that was a lot. I think of, I did all of all, shows. Rings of Power. I think I did the entire series because I, I rewatched the first episode because I watched it so long ago. I haven't watched Rings of Power yet, so I don't know. It's like it. it's like six or eight episodes, and they're over an hour each. Or Holy smokes, like that they're, it's ludicrously long. But I watched the whole entire, I think the entire thing on Saturday. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm trapped in the room. There's nothing, nowhere yeah, I can I guess go. so. And uh, so I, or maybe it was Sunday. So I, uh, I did, I, okay, listen, not everything has to be Game of Thrones. <laughs> Okay, that's all I. Yeah, right. That's all I want to say this about is the Rings Lord of, of the Power. Rings. It has its yeah. own thing for sure. There's lots yeah. of source material to draw upon. There, you know, the thing about the Lord, the, like Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, that even when things are dire, there's like this through line of hope and come off, camaraderie. That's kind and everything of the else. point of the whole thing. Yeah, uh, there were certain cuts, like where like they cut away from the 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 terrible thing that that, that they just shown happen. Right when it happened, and then you're like left with the terrible feeling. Oh ah, my god, okay. everybody's dead mm. or whatever. Mm. When it to me, the, the Lord of the Rings would, you know, if shot differently, would have been more along the lines of it cuts, you know, cuts away right after the the character like sees or maybe one of the main characters sees it and then grits their teeth and pushes forward before mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. you cut away to give that sort of I guess hope or whatever or sense yep. that not all not not all is lost. Um, there's, you know, I can see why people were, the way, you know, I saw a lot of headlines, you know, fans are furious at whatever, and it's usually like fan <laughs> well, on Reddit yes, yeah. is furious about it. Or there's whatever. always I somebody could, furious. I could see why people might look at this and say, this is not my Lord of the Rings. This nah. is not the way that I feel about the Lord of the Rings. I liked what they tried to do with Galadriel. Which mm-hmm. is kind of make her showing her young, yeah. If that makes sense, yeah. Because this is a her, prequel to everything that we've yeah. seen in the previous movies, even so. The it, in 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 the later movie, in the you know the Lord of the Rings trilogy, she is, and I haven't seen the Hobbit because I'm not going to watch it. But she is, you know, wise and old, and has been around. I mean, she's been around for a long time at this point, but she's yeah. still young for for an elf, and she's sure. hot headed, and I. I like that. I like kind of liked what they did with her. Uh, and there were one of my, I guess my favorite parts of it. Like every favorite part was almost always in a, uh, like a like a funny interaction between two characters. Mm-hmm. Like when um, I cannot remember either of their names, but the dwarf and the elf who were friends. He ends up being the leader of the elves in uh, in the Fellowship of the Ring. Oh yeah, he's H- Hugo Weaving. Whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. his characters. I can't remember his name offhand either. I can't remember it right now. (laughs) But, um, you know, their relationship is just great. And and that, to me, felt very... Like, those moments when they're, like, quipping with each other, but also talking about serious stuff at the same time, and the wife of the dwarf uh, was... I thought she was amazing. Uh, There was a lot of... There's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. The, The real problem is that the Rings of Power... Not only didn't it show up until like the very okay. very end, which bothered me, but also like if you paid attention at all to the movies, it you were told a certain thing, okay? Yeah, yeah. And what was shown in this series was not what you were told. Ah, okay. Okay, you well, were told that I guess that's the point. <laughs> a certain thing happened. <laughs> yeah. And in this series you're like, but that's not what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not that's Retcon. not. I mean, I mean, I guess you could maybe like if you're like, oh, with 
you can kind of sh- twist the language and say, well, technically, it is kind of what happened. Well, and by the not- time of the Lord of the Rings, things had fallen to legend and that type of idea. Exactly, which, I mean, I just... I thought that there were so, so many ways they could have done it a little bit better. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, production value, everything else, totally amazing. Okay. You, certainly they can pull this back and, and do do more with it. But it didn't seem to have the, la- the right tone for me, I guess, was the biggest problem. Again, at this point, I'm very tired of watching anything. <laughs> uh, and lastly, I, I, I re- went back and finished Wakanda Forever, which yes. is the one movie I watched this entire time with the new Black Panther movie. Uh, the, I mean, it's a great movie. Uh, I like it better than the first one. Oh, okay. In in some ways. Okay. Now, the biggest problem is that as much as I wanted to like Namor, and I, I did like his character, mm-hmm. I didn't feel that he was like menacing enough. I that. know. I know what that, you mean. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. You know, like, like there needed everything to be was a... there in in yes. like on the page. If you read it in the script, everything is there, and yet somehow the presence on screen didn't quite capture it. The thing about Killmonger and all the best, uh, or Jeff Jeff Bridges in the first mm-hmm. Iron Man, you know, all the best villains in you know uh, Thanos. They are. There's a moment where you see how menacing they are. Mm-hmm. And it's it's very rarely the the kind of fallback of somebody reports to me something I don't like I kill them therefore I'm the bad guy. Mm. It's something worse than that, you know. It's something so, sometimes less, but sometimes more than that. And uh, there wasn't that with this character, and I, I just wanted I just wanted that moment. If they had had that moment where I was afraid of him a little bit more, or afraid. well, I think it's because Namor is like also sort like he's sometimes a good guy, like he's been part of the Avengers in the comics and that. So yes. I think they're trying to set all that up where they're like, well, he's not a villain. <laughs> I think there's some of that. Well, he's definitely in. They, they definitely went with a more gray area here. Well, uh, yeah, he's he's the antagonist, but yeah, they're trying to keep it so that he can be a hero in the future. Yeah. Uh, I don't think people who don't read comics really understand just how often somebody is like full on trying to kill all the characters yeah. in one char- in one episode or one 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 book, and the next book they're like, "Well, now he's going to be their leader." <laughs> it's like, like what? I remember when Magneto started Norman leading Osborn the X-Men or Doctor Doom. Like, <laughs> I was like, Magneto starts leading the X Men because yes. Charles Xavier's in a coma, and yeah. you're like. What you know? This guy's been trying to kill you guys but forever. They always like, respected well. each other, Tom. They always had a respect for one another. So, you know, I just uh, uh. yeah. So I I I did like it in in many ways. This, it, the special effects are way better than because the hmm. in the first one, uh, you know the uh, it definitely didn't need to be two hours and forty one minutes. Long. Nope. Okay, <laughs> and I want to blame, and I say this with. All the respect that 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 you can possibly muster. I want to blame Chadwick Boseman for this being this long because I think putting a, a lot of you know the 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 um uh the goodbyes to him in sure. there definitely lengthened this movie, and I have no problems with that. No, but they definitely could have taken other stuff away, <laughs> and this could still be still be have all that stuff in it, and still have uh. A, a two-hour movie, as far as I'm concerned. So, yes, if I had w- only one note, I have very few notes for Kevin Feige. As far, I mean, sure. some movies are I'm not going to like, and some movies are not going to be as good as they want them to be. They're doing a heck of a lot be. over there. They're doing a lot, but my one note is, my dude, you get two hours and ten minutes. Okay, that's including <laughs> credits. Okay, that's including credits. Every movie comes in under two hour and ten minutes. That's all I want. That's all I want Marvel to start doing is just say, you know what, we're getting out of hand over here. We need to sh- we need to make these movies shorter. And it's not because I want the movie theaters to make more mo- money or whatever. I'm just like, it's 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 too much. Well, speaking I, of I, making things shorter, <laughs> yes, let's, let's get race going. through our intro because we spent half an hour on this, so we're almost out of time. <laughs> Yeah, I am going to be coughing and maybe yeah. getting up and going to get that box of Kleenex over there that's on yep, the ground. Yep, yep. That I, so we'll see. Uh, Save Your Rant, the podcast that will occasionally answer your home theater and AV <laughs> questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask us by emailing us a question at avrant.com. Go to our website to find the older episodes, including our uh, show notes and Flickr albums, where you can follow mm-hmm. along with the pictures. 
uh, facebook.com slash AV rant podcast, youtube.com slash AV rant, where you can see us talking to each other. Hopefully I don't yep. know what's going on with this. Still podcast. doing all right for now. I still can't get my, my internet, like my, my web browser will not, I'm nah. afraid. Cause the thing is, is the show notes are on the, the my, my script is online, right? Is yeah. on, and it's open it's right Google now on my, yeah. my Chrome browser. I want to close this and reopen it to see if that'll fix it. Oh, don't do I'm that. Af- I'm afraid. Well, yeah, yeah so just I keep can. it here. If so, you can whatever. see it for now, that's good enough. You can contact us directly. Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter's at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. All right. Uh, thank, our, thank our listeners of the week. To become yeah. a listener of the week, you support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to our website, avrant.com, clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, and sending us a PayPal donation, which is Jonathan and Stephen did. So thank you to Jonathan. Thank you to Stephen. Thank you, Jonathan and Stephen, for your PayPal donations. Appreciate your financial support. And if you prefer, you can go to patreon.com slash podcast, where we can you can sign up to become a contributing monthly subscriber to our podcast. So we have 141 patrons over at patreon.com, including Julian. So thank you to all of you. That's right. That's patreon.com slash podcast. If you'd like to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. So big thanks to our 141 patrons. Julian, thanks for being one of them. We also want to thank... Uh, Anybody who, who supports us in any way, and we will mention you here, Joe did that by sending some pictures for me to use on avgadgets.com. So thank yeah, you, thank Joe. you, Joe. Appreciate that. And we got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going during the, well, I guess the big train, what's the burn, what's the thing that's happening in the world that's terrible right now? I guess the train, right? In Ohio. There was train in Ohio. There are toxic yeah. chemicals that are probably. Continuing re- things in Turkey and Syria. Those, yes. Uh, from the earthquake and uh, there's things being shot out of the sky on a daily basis now. So. I feel like that's something we knew about and like we never really talked about it and like I Twitter got a hold of it or tiktok did and now now people care i feel like that's something that that, that the government people are like but we, we do we've been doing this for years we one would about? think yeah <clears throat> anyways um so we got no cigarette to keep the podcast going from anders greg jonathan who says he dropped off from listening to us for several years but that's our own fault we did such a good job helping him get get his vacation home theater looking and sounding great they didn't really have any more questions to ask but now he's back Welcome back. Welcome back, Jonathan. <laughs> Steve was giddy to hear a t- us talk about his 5.1 setup where he used upfiring and Sony Atmos modules instead of a regular surround speakers. He made his wife listen to us to prove he's internet famous now. That's right. Okay. Enjoy <laughs> it. <laughs> All right, Steve's wife. <laughs> Don't let his head get too big because believe me, <laughs> it should not be inflating at all. <laughs> Julian appreciates all the work we put in the podcast and glad we aren't slinging the same ads as almost all other podcasts out there seem to be. If anybody would like us to sling some ads for you, please. Hey, oh. Tom at AVRant.com. Oh, okay. <laughs> as if we have time for that. <laughs> Dan, who says, hooray for Lee finally getting his AVRant email address. I don't know what he's talking about. And mm. Daz. So thank you to all of you. I'll say the names one more time. Anders, Greg, Jonathan, Steve, Julian, Dan, and Daz. Thank you all very much for sending in those notes of gratitude. Your notes of encouragement are definitely appreciated. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. So at the ISE conference, I don't know what that is, in Barcelona, Chernov partnered up with Crix Loudspeakers, an Australian brand, to mm-hmm. demonstrate their new active acoustic space optimization system. Online speculation before the event was that Trinov Active Acoustics would be their answer to Iraq active live, uh, I'm sorry, active room treatment, but it turned out to be an altogether different approach. 16, 18, okay, 16, 18 inch subwoofers were used, eight at the front of the room, another eight at the back of the room as part of a 13.6 point, I'm sorry, 13.16.6 speaker <laughs> configuration. That's right. Since That's Turnoff actually right because it was 16 subs and six overhead speakers. So those numbers are in the correct order. <laughs> okay. Since trade off processors are almost infinitely configurable, each of the 16 subwoofers can be individually adjusted. Yep. I mean, I'm going to be honest here. This is a completely practical solution to this problem that everybody is going to buy. Sure, sure. Who couldn't fit that and afford it? <clears throat> at its core, what Trinov is using is a double base array. The subwoofers at the front of the room are calibrated to work together to create a planar wave. The eight subwoofers at the back of the room are directly out of phase so as to fully cancel any standing waves. While it seems like an awful lot of subwoofers and result essentially a fully anechoic base response. So there's no room gain at all to increase the sound pressure level. The entirety of the base SPL has to be delivered directly by the subwoofers themselves. Yeah. <laughs> which means no full range speakers. 
Chernoff's processing is there to somewhat automate the process of individually calibrating the array of subwoofers to all work together, particularly when the room is not a perfect rectangle, but their own representatives fully acknowledge that the very best results will occur, will occur when the room itself is optimized for a double base array setup. So that's, yeah. Yeah, whatever. so this, uh, I mean, uh, this is not in any way... Um similar yeah. to to what Dirac is doing with their active room correction that is a uh, a very different uh, approach now double base array on paper absolutely works mathematically absolutely works in real world deployment where even if you build a perfect rectangle of a room it isn't acoustically a perfect rectangle because some any variances in the materials um you know once you put seats and risers and people in there uh there there are you know small little differences now the whole idea is that trinov's very sophisticated measurement and ample processing power is all there to uh you know, work all of that out make the double base array act actually work uh, the way that it, it, it does just according to math and calculations when you're dealing with acoustically perfect spaces. Um, the whole idea is to, is to be able to calculate your way to, to the same results. So, I mean, the notion behind it, I get it. Um, do we really want anechoic sounding response in our rooms? Like, again, this is the type of thing where I just suspect people are going to put this in there and then be tremendously disappointed at how not crazy loud and boomy the bass yeah. ever is. Because I think when you, you know, stick 16 subwoofers in a room, you're expected to, you know, achieve liftoff from your seat. And it's really going to be the opposite. It's going to be like taking a very powerful subwoofer outside and listening to it in the outdoors where it doesn't sound nearly as impressive as putting it inside an enclosure. Right. So <laughs> it's, yeah, it's very, it's a, it's a, it's a strange thing because I, I feel like you will lose the, the kick you in the chestness of, uh, I mean, it's just going to have to be directly there. Right. You know? Yeah. Right. So it's, I it's, mean, it's, I think this is one that's going to, like, the I'm, graphs are going to look spectacular. Yes, they're going to be then, very flat. And then the actual experience of it, I, I'm not sure if people are genuinely going to love it. You know, it, I, I I question whether people are going to actually It will prefer. allow you to, to, to perfectly set a room curve and get yes. exactly yeah. that curve. That which, is right. from a custom installer standpoint, is... Like, okay, we put this in here, and, and this is what it sounds like raw. Oh, I don't like that. Yes, but now we can make it sound exactly the way you want it to sound. Your room will be exactly what you want. In fact, yeah. you can you what, get what every you see note, on the graph is decide. what you're going to get. That's right. <laughs> At every You seat. choose. You yeah. choose. Just draw a line on here, and That's this is right. what it will sound like. And uh, so I, 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 I'm not against this. I think nope. it's fine. I think it's a... It's complete and overkill. I think it but. makes sense for Trinov because you yes. know they can go up to forty-eight, uh, you know, speaker channels on their thing, uh, which is beyond even what you know the twenty-four point one point ten uh, maximum of of Atmos plus you know the additional four channels that exist in Oro three D and don't exist in Atmos. They can do all of those and still have channels left over with the forty-eight channel expansion to you know have a bunch of individually calibrated subwoofers. So I get it. It makes sense for them uh for the types of um you know hope theaters that are built around Trinov processors it's going to be the clientele who can dedicate the room to it and have it constructed from the ground up and deploy you know this uh, this type of scale so all of it adds up but it is interesting to me that this actually will still require even more regular room treatments than Dirac's active room <laughs> treatment because this is not addressing the crossover Th yeah. This is the, the subwoofers only. You are still going to need your bass traps to uh, smooth out the transition <coughs> from the speakers to the subwoofers. And this is not addressing, you know, like the, the Dirac um, active room treatment is supposed to be getting upwards of, you know, 500 hertz or so uh, when it eventually comes out. We don't know yet because it hasn't actually right. arrived in the Storm Audio products. But, you know, the, the idea that this is going to reduce the number of acoustic treatments you have, I mean, really not really in, in this yeah. case because this this is strictly about the subwoofers. So, uh, yeah, an interesting thing. Um, I, I, I don't, th obviously, just from a sheer cost point of view and a practicality point of view, it's not going to be what a lot of, uh, certainly not Tom or I are not going to be doing this. Uh, but uh, I also just think that, yeah, if people are hearing it for the first time, it, it might not be what they expect when you're thinking, I have this many subwoofers in my room. Yeah. 
This comes from our listener, Daz. Martin Logan has updated their Motion and Motion XT series speakers. All models come in three finish options, gloss black, gloss white, and walnut. The most common. <laughs> I mean, literally... No gigantic surprises, the, but the at least it's not com- only black. <laughs> yeah. They use a second generation Obsidian folded ribbon tweeter with the XT or Extreme, which is XT stands for, yeah. series being 40% larger than the standard motion series. The tweeters are now in the waveguide, aiming to match their dispersion to the drivers and slightly increasing sensitivity. They are avoiding rear-firing ports in favor of down-firing or folded ports in the smaller speaker mod- model- models. Mm-hmm. Centers are a two and a half way design. Base drivers are aluminum. Mid range drivers are woven fiberglass in the Motion series and Kevlar in the Motion XT series, which I hate to break it to you are basically the same thing, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> but whatever. One pays for the 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 yeah, name, well, one, I guess. One is aramid fiber and the other's fiberglass fiber. So yep. whatever. Mm-hmm. So if price is here, the Motion Series, the it's got B10, C10, F10, F20, whatever. So the B10 is a bookshelf, of course, $600 each. The C10 is a center, it's $1,000. The F10 is a tower with five and a half inch mid, two five and a half inch base drivers, mm-hmm. and that stupid tweeter they're just talking about, $1,250 each. The F20 tower has uh, same the same mid range driver, five and a half, with uh, two six and a half inch base drivers That's for right. seven. 1750 each and the mp10 wedge shaped surround which everybody should give some sort of <laughs> some sort of so some royalty to to, to uh svs a subwoofer company that that's right. the first one that really kind of came out with that uh for uh 500 each i mean mm-hmm. i'm sure that there were wedge shaped speakers out before svs came there out were with it, but, but whatever they popularized it so the XT series has the same stupid numbers. B10 instead of B10, it's B100. So whatever. So the bookshelf is eight hundred dollars each. The center is fifteen hundred dollars each. The tower, the F100 tower, is a six and a half inch mid with three six and a half inch base drivers for twenty two fifty. The F20 tower is six and a half inch mid, three eight inch base drivers for uh, twenty seven fifty. And let me just As stop. Each, by the way, yeah, yeah, each. Let me just stop all you who are like, well, you know, should I match the driver, the the one with the one driver to the <laughs> one with the other driver? Just stop. The size of the driver makes no difference. These things can all probably they, I, I, they would all sound, I would imagine, remarkably similar. <laughs> it's just the amount of output that they can do. Yeah. So yeah. whatever. No, I mean, I very much liked uh, the original Motion series. Uh, I'm I'm never going to say no to a, a well designed waveguide. I mean, I don't know for sure that uh, this has uh, helped the dispersion match up, but uh, certainly it can. So uh, Martin Logan knows how to design speakers. I have no reason to really doubt that uh, they've they've made some at least on paper improvements here. They ticked up the sense by a couple of db so that's that's never a bad thing either so yeah i like folded motion uh tweeters quite a bit uh they they have that nice fast transient response and they're really very efficient so uh, yeah adding that into a waveguide i'm happy to see that and uh there we go yeah i think those will be i think these will be nice speakers uh i am shocked to be reading this right now and those of you that have been around as long as i have should also be shocked so this mm-hmm. comes from jonathan our listener, who says that uh, Mark Shifter has returned to the online audio world. If you're like, who's that? Well, back in 2010, he was indicted by a jan- gr- jur- grand jury on multiple counts of fraud were running the popular, at the time, online audio company AV123. So many things he did were wrong. <laughs> so... He's the, he did not he's not the only one that's ever done this and there's companies right now that are still doing it but he was famous for taking pre-orders for things that didn't exist and maybe never shipped and that was really what happened in 2012 was that side of things it yeah. was the charities fraud that he got indicted for in right. 2010 in 2010 he started a charity for somebody that was supposedly had cancer or something like that and then just embezzled all the money. Uh, yeah. Well, that was actually uh, David Fabricant of Ascend Acoustics. Uh, it wasn't David himself. It was right. a family was member of David's. Family member, right. Uh, right, right. Uh, that, that was one of the charities frauds where he mm-hmm. started a, a charity drive uh, for, for David Fabricant's uh, family member and uh, that money went to Mark Shifter. None yeah. of it to David or the family member. So in 2012, he was arrested again and that was for the pre-order stuff that we were just talking yeah. about and, and we didn't hear again uh we didn't hear about them for the past 11 years i've actually every like every 
you know, three or four years, I'm like, whatever happened to that dude? dude well, and there was a little bit of an AV rant connection because uh, you talked about all this back when Dina was your co-host and yeah. uh, she gave him the nickname Shifty Shifter. So yes. uh, I remember that well. There you go. I did not. <laughs> but he's back online selling audio products through two websites. First of all, do not buy anything from this man. Do not support any website that he's he's. Uh, I certainly with. would not. Yes. Um, do not. Uh, there is. Don't assume that anything he's selling does anything it claims to do. <laughs> do not assume. First of all, and and I don't know that I've ever talked about this. I know from firsthand accounts of manufacturers that have worked with him that uh, he not only would. Uh, uh, make deals that he would not make good on, mm. but he would also sell their products as his own, ah. and then you know never give you know, just basically never give him credit. So I mean, just to else. just to cover ourselves, I suppose we should say, I mean, uh, apparently all- debt paid to society. I don't know exactly what all happened at the no, end of all either. the legal proceedings, and uh, and you know the the past. And I don't is begrudge not this necessarily man the present, but having a life or going, you know, getting back into society and making good and everything else. I don't know what's mm-hmm. happened to him. All I know is that he can't be in audio anymore. Okay, that's it. He's got to find something else to do with his life <laughs> that are, that is not audio because th- he can't be trusted in audio. It just he has too long, too much of a history. Right. In it. We we can so say we, we we ourselves w- would yeah. not purchase from these that websites my, and would not trust him. That my personal opinion. That. And if you're allowed, right. if you if you were to ask my opinion on whether or not you should, I would say you should do what I'm going to do, which is never buy another thing from that man. <laughs> so verify audio, which is uh, one of the websites he's now associated with, where he offers a $250 line conditioner and a $350 fuse. I'm sorry, $395 fuse box. Neither of which uh, sounds like something you should buy. I would click on it and figure out what it is, but I can't because my <laughs> internet's not working right. right. And XSA, X is the letter, S is the letter, and A, Labs, uh, which stands for, and we're not making this up, Extremely Sexy Audio, where he sells a bookshelf speaker model and has announced a stereo amplifier, which I'm sure he's taking pre-orders for, which you should not send him any money for. So, no, I um, do not. Do not. I miss, I, I, I can't stress strongly enough my opinion that uh, this is... Uh, not where you should be spending your money. And I don't mm-hmm. care how good the deal seems or how great the specs is. One of the things that he was so very good at was selling. And he would he could sell products that didn't exist through just post after post of talking about like how excited he was about it. And that excitement was contagious. And people would get excited and they would start talking about it. And next thing you know, he's got this following. Um, don't. It's very cult-like the way that he draws people <laughs> it certainly in. certainly can be, yeah. So I also, on one of the websites, I can't remember which one of them, but uh, if you scroll down a little bit and they're just talking about some parts of the company, there's like, there's just an image of, of just a hand making the okay sign, which unfortunately has now also become the white power sign. <laughs> I thought like, we were past that. I thought we were back to it just being an okay I, sign again. I sure hope it was only intended to be an okay sign and nothing more. Um just a little bit of a weird choice that that that's the only thing the only image that didn't really have anything to do with that hand symbol and it just it all feels a bit weird <laughs> comments uh, from our listener steve he says with the up this is uh he's with the up firing atmos modules being used mm-hmm. as surround speakers if you remember from last week Rob wondered last week if his Moran's uh, NR1403 receiver had a virtual listening mode, which would try to rec- uh, tr- create a surround effect when using only 3.1 speaker setup. It does. So Steve gave it a try and compared it to his 5.1 speaker setup with the Atmos modules on the top of his front left and right speakers. Virtual listening mode wasn't terrible, but it did provide a bit of an, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it did provide a bit of an enveloping effect, but compared to his 5.1 setup, it was still harder to separate the surround effects from the front channel sound. So he's declaring victory for the upfiring Atmos modules <laughs> being used as surround speakers. Again, your revol- your results may vary on that one. So sure. Whatever. Yeah, it can be room dependent for sure. But the main thing is his wife is okay with this setup and wouldn't be okay with physical surround speakers <laughs> placed in the surround positions. So this definitely wins uh, hands down as, as being the thing that uh, keeps the marriage together. 
<laughs> oh, good. Infinite Gary did some HDMI troubleshooting in his main theater that we suggested. As far as you can tell, it's actually a couple of the HDMI inputs on this Anthem Pre Pro that are starting to have problems. The HDMI inputs on this Pioneer Kuro and Runco projector seem to be okay, and the HDMI outputs on this Anthem seem okay. It was the HDMI inputs one and two on the Anthem that seemed to be dropping signals randomly. So he mm. plugged his sources from inputs one and two into, into inputs five and six instead, and things seem to be okay at the moment. That's not a good sign. Yeah, I, I mean, look, man, <laughs> AV receivers uh, eventually having uh, HDMI boards begin to fail is is pretty darn common um, yeah. across all brands. Uh, they are seem to be a fairly fragile and finicky piece of uh, uh, of internal componentry uh, are the HDMI boards. Uh, it was kind of fun watching the um, uh, Sound United, the Massimo uh, demonstrations of what's inside of their flagship, like the A1H, and like they have this massive HDMI board with heat sinks all over it now because it's you know <laughs> HDMI 2.1 uh, with the with the A1H, and uh, yeah, they, they're trying to overbuild that thing and not have failing HDMI boards quite evidently. Uh, but yeah, Anthem, very reliable brand. And he's had that processor for years and years and years and years. Uh, but it, it would not be a shock uh, for an HDMI board to begin to fail. The good thing is Anthem is the type of company that definitely stands behind their products and has uh, the ability to make that type of repair. I'm certain there would be a charge for it at this yeah. point because you're way, 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 way out of warranty. Uh, but just the idea that a repair might be possible, at least with a company like Anthem, Boy. not out of the question. So it'd be Sounds worth like Gary needs them. 16 subwoofers in this room and oh, yeah, Anthem processor. Greg, this is our first question here, finally. <laughs> Rob pontificating about his TV shows. Uh, Greg, long update, short question. So Greg had the JVC RS540 projector with the aging lamp that was working okay, but when, then he put in a replacement lamp only to have the image turn purple after about 10 minutes every time the projector warmed up. We thought it might be something like a slightly bent connector pin uh, was the cause since the old lamp worked fine, but no amount of switching bare bulbs or entire bulbs plus housing ever s solved the issue, unfortunately. Yeah. One of our listeners su suggested that he try putting the projector into high altitude mode just to see if the, if heat was the culprit that actually seemed to work for about three weeks but the problem came back and started to happen more frequently and then even high altitude mode wasn't helping anymore plus the fan noise was very unpleasant so we dug around the forums and found a few other people having similar problems he some sent their units in for repair reported back that it wound up costing them about three thousand dollars to fix ah seems, yes seems like a lot that's a lot so that was Half out of the, the question the for him. <laughs> and he started looking for a whole new projector, but now that now he was a bit gun shy about uh, JVC in general. That's mm. silly, but whatever, that's fine. And to get a current model will cost more than he wanted to pay anyway. So that went, is certainly fair. Yes. That is not silly. That is very, very reasonable. So he went for an Epson. The black levels are indeed not as deep as his JVC used to be, but he quickly adjusted and thinks his Epson looks really, really good. In fact, the overall quality of the image seems more consistent when switching between SDR content and HDR content. So he's satisfied with the purchase. He still wanted to feel as though something had been truly upgraded, though. So he ordered the 12 by 12 framed 6 millimeter piece of glass from hometheaterglass.com. Mm -hmm. The back wall of his theater has a storage area on the other side, so he cut a square hole, sealed up the edges with caulk, and used a basic black picture frame uh, on the theater side to make it look uh, finished and pretty. Com completely bare glass would have been about 100 bucks. but he didn't consider himself that handy, so he got a pre-framed piece of glass uh, for about $180 all in. This was their simplest offering and getting a custom smaller window wouldn't have cost any less. They also have a thicker glass or dual pane options and their customer service and shipping were prompt, so he's happy with the whole experience. Now he has no projector fan noise at all and his wife likes the cleaner look in the theater with no projector hanging down from the ceiling anymore. It makes it nicer for the back row not having anything hanging above their heads too. Obviously a window in your projector uh, for your projector at the back of the room won't work for everybody's setup, but he highly recommends it now if you're able to do it and he gives a thumb thumbs up to hometheaterglass.com for sure. So there you go. And we got pictures showing how we got it all set up. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. It's just sitting in the like a storage room by itself, like with, That's a, right. with a, other things. It's like on the shelf back there. It's but it like, very much looks like a, a full-on movie theater where they have this type of setup, a separate room for the projector and with the a window. Yeah, the window frame thing looks like, for those of you that aren't looking at the pictures, it looks like the if you look in the project in a, in a real theater, you look back, there's like that 
kind of like recessed frame. That's right. Yeah, you know, like and like, the glass is actually at a little bit of an <clears throat> angle yeah. inside of this pre-built frame. So I mean, to me, that is worth you know paying some additional money if you're not tremendously handy. Because even though this is very low reflectance glass, you can see in the photos that you took, it does still reflect something. And so they have that built-in angle so that you don't get light reflecting right back down the barrel <laughs> of the projector um, and make sure that you get the clearest image possible. So you know, having that pre-built for you, that that is certainly there is value attached to that and then made yeah. the installation of everything that much more simple so yeah i'm happy that you're happy with your epson 5050 ub that is a really good projector it is certainly what i would go to when a jvc is not affordable and unfortunately even their least expensive current model the np5 is quite expensive now you know it's a seven thousand dollar projector so you know three thousand dollars for the 5050 ub is definitely a difference in price it's a very significant one so totally makes sense and yeah when you aren't comparing them side by side or, or looking at them a b comparison uh the epson 5050 is still a very impressive projector with uh, with darn good contrast and black levels so happy that you're happy with it and uh, yeah that's a nice little upgrade with the window you installed so he, he's got a question yeah. after all this. He's got his JVC projector on hand. He'd like to sell it for parts or as is for someone else to have repaired. Uh, what do we think is a fair asking price? He could include his chief ceiling mount along with it. He's been he's seen used RS four five forties, excuse me, in good working condition, going for about twenty five hundred bucks. So half of that. What do we think? I mean, I am the wrong person to ask. Yeah, neither <laughs> of us is like a lot of, of, of selling our equipment used. <laughs> I, I, you know who you should ask? You should ask Andrew over yeah. at AV Gadgets. So yeah. you should ask him. He would be the one to ask because he, he sells stuff all the time. But honestly, I I mean, people have this idea, that, and it goes kind of back to the sunk cost fallacy that I've talked about a lot of times before, but they somehow look at something that, that still has value to other people and thinking that that it should still, they should still be able to get some of that value back. The fact is, is that you bought a projector and you used it for its entire life. Its life mm. is now over, right? At this point, <laughs> it's, it's life, it's usable life is over. It'll never be unless you want to spend three thousand dollars on it apparently it's never going to be put back to right so at mm. some point you just have to look at it and go i i spent this amount of money on it i got this amount of money did i or mm. ask yourself did i get this amount of money out of it because if you didn't well, <laughs> then you know but you i think you have in which case either way even if you haven't either way it still has no value to you so i would literally put it up on craigslist or you know facebook marketplace and just say Make me an offer for this thing and, right. you know, make it's it. It's funny. You know, I mean, this is clearly why neither Tom nor I is a salesperson because yeah. we, we always undervalue our stuff. I always undervalue my stuff oh, yeah. when I sell it. I, I'm i I'm very generous and people get a great deal for me because I, I always, I, I never want to like offend by asking too much. And I know I could have gotten more money for things that I do sell. Um, uh, so uh, I always I just, undervalue it. So, I mean, yeah, my, my inclination is like, yeah, uh, a used item that, you know, isn't like, really still quite new and just happens to have been open box or something like that like i do tend to go to half whatever the original price was which is what the 2500 you know that that projector originally was about a five thousand dollar projector and then saying well it isn't in perfect working order and if you want to get it in perfect working order there's like a three thousand dollar repair so right. you know to me asking yeah a half of that again like the number of people that can actually use the like you're like i could sell it for parts to whom mm. who who are the people out there that are going to buy it for parts? Because I'll tell you right now, they'll just buy the parts. Like, they don't right. know that the parts inside <laughs> your projector work at all. They don't know what part of it's broken. But see, they know what you... We're yeah, they know probably, what you think is wrong, but that doesn't tell them anything. We're probably undervaluing it for sure. So, I mean, to me, I would probably do like 1250 and then or best offer. I would definitely put or best offer because I'm yeah. going to basically take whatever someone is willing to offer for it that isn't completely insulting. But um, yeah, I, I get, yeah, we're really not the right people. No, no. To I, 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 I we're mean, not would, good at the used equipment game on either end of it, to be honest. You know, I would go to my local shop and just say, listen, you know, this is this projector doesn't work anymore. This is what, what was wrong with it. Mm -hmm. You guys can have it for parts and, you know, maybe cut me a break next time I come in here for anything. And then <laughs> never come in wow. Here. Yeah, you're really undervaluing. I, I just I just I'm don't because I, I, I don't think it has any value. I just don't. Oh, I, I, well, I, I think don't it has some point. value. And yeah. I think the value is 
I don't have to throw it away or figure out how to responsibly recycle yeah. this thing. That's the value. Like <laughs> you're take that's the value I'm getting from you. Like I don't have to get, I don't have to deal with this anymore. Yes, it's take it from me, ah. please. Kieran in India. Kieran's brother needs a basic two-channel am stereo amplifier. Kieran, I, I, I wonder about the needs part of it, but I'm going to just assume that 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 You can need sometimes is, need a two-channel amplifier. There are absolutely uh, times There's a lot when more people who want one than actually need one. Sure. But Kieran has auditioned both Crown and Emotiva, and honestly couldn't say he knows the audible difference. His brother definitely won't be pushing either to its limits. Okay. In India, the Crown Amp is quite a bit less expensive. And that's true here as well. But its noise and distortion specs are higher, depending on mm -hmm. which Crown you go with. But whatever. Yep. Real world, though, when do we actually start to perceive a difference indicated by the specs is, is at a certain volume level? Um, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be a, necessarily a volume level if the speakers you're trying to drive are very hard and the amp, sure. you know, yeah. the, the amp is not very powerful or doesn't, doesn't match very well. Um, so the problem with Crown amps or any pro amps, and we've talked about this multiple times, but let's just re rehash real quick here, is that they're built for professional settings, which mm -hmm. generally means that they are off in a closet someplace far away from <laughs> everybody else. So it doesn't matter that they're allowed to have fans in, the, in, in you know, or bulky or weird shapes or whatever. None of that matters. So they, uh, they, can, they can have audible fans that are pushing a mm -hmm. lot of air and everything else and cool them off, have oodles of power. And uh, can be l built uh, less expensively. And that's because, you know, a, a, a very powerful, very quiet uh, or silent in, in the case of Umativa, those amplifiers are harder to make and more expensive to make. And therefore, they're going to be more expensive to, to buy. Uh, plus, the aesthetics are also important for Umativa because mm -hmm. they are expected to be in the room with you, and whereas Crown Amps, again, aren't. <laughs> so, uh, you can get silent crown amps. They exist. Yeah. They are And they do have equaled. some class AB ones. Yes. Um, because the thing to know about the class D amplifiers uh that you'll that you'll often find from Crown Pro is that uh you might look at them and go, there are like at least a half a dozen models yes. that all say the same wattage. Why do they have so many different models of class D amplifiers <laughs> with like it's not as though these are all, you know, obviously different wattages. Like why are they so different? Well, a lot of what's going on there is they they are tailored to a quite specific impedance profile. That's right. You know, they'll have ones that are meant. I mean, they almost build them for specific speakers. It's all <laughs> like, that is almost true, and that's like, we, I, I've talked about that on Navy Gadgets. I believe I can't tell you the article because I can't get on the internet. Yes, but yeah. uh, you know what they end up doing is you have to be a speaker like an amplifier expert you have to be able to look well, at you those, have to the, at the, least like profile actually understand yes. impedance loads and uh you know like frequency versus impedance of a given speaker and get the amplifier that is you know tailored to work properly like some speakers will have lower impedance at higher frequencies which necessitates a slightly different class d design to avoid any you know audible artifacts going on with that so that's why you'll see a half a dozen different crown amplifiers with very similar wattage specifications, but tailored to different impedance loads. Because unlike the very expensive consumer class D amplifiers that have so many filters on it that you can attach it to any speaker load, because that's exactly what they know they have to do for the consumer market, is not pay attention to what speakers you're attaching to it and just be ready to drive anything. But then you end up with a very expensive class D amplifier uh, for the consumer market, whereas you can have far fewer filters if you know the people buying this know how to match it to the exact type of speaker uh, impedance profile that, that this particular class D amplifier was designed for. So I would I would recommend as a consumer that you go for the class AB design that Crown does have because yeah. that is not going to be nearly the price as dependent. Delta becomes much smaller, <laughs> you know. But yeah. I don't know in India that that's yeah yeah the yeah. Thing. yeah yeah. There's still there still is a, a price savings there. Uh, but yeah, you're still going to have the active cooling fans inside of uh, of the uh, Crown amplifier. So that is something to be aware of in terms of. You're looking at specs for specs, right? The Emotiva specs, the wattage specs, and the noise specs, and the uh, harmonic distortion specs versus the crown ones. Where does that actually come into play? <laughs> well, 
that comes into play at the extremes. That comes yes. into play in the noise floor. And then if you do have a signal requesting essentially the maximum power that either of these amplifiers can deliver, that's when that noise and harmonic distortion spec comes into it. The signal to noise ratio spec is going to come in on the low end uh, on the noise floor. So for the vast majority of the time that you're ever using either of these, it's not going to be in an audible range where you're like, oh, because this one was specified specified to be 200 watts into 8 ohms the entire frequency range but at 1% total harmonic distortion when it's delivering all 200s of, of its watts versus the emotiva that is you know rated for 200 watts 8 ohms the entire frequency range but at 0.05% total harmonic distortion when it's delivering all 200 of its watts so when I'm listening at 65 decibels I'm going to hear that extra harmonic distortion in the crown no no, that isn't going to happen. That isn't going to be audible because at that point, you're probably using less than one watt from mm. either of those amplifiers to drive a speaker to 65 or 75 decibels. You're almost certainly using less than one watt or maybe right around one watt at that point. Um, and you aren't going to be running into, well, how much harmonic distortion is there when it's delivering 200 watts? That isn't happening at that point. So it is really only showing you the extreme. So in terms of, yeah, if you aren't, hearing the noise from the cooling fans, uh, if you aren't worried about the noise floor, if those aren't the issues, then the chances that you're going to notice the harmonic distortion spec yeah, difference is, is basically nil in this mm -hmm. case. So hopefully those are the things to be considerate of uh, when it comes to come crown apps, but you absolutely can use them in a yeah. home system with great yeah. results. Uh, yeah, just be aware of the aesthetics, the active cooling fans, and I would probably aim for the class AB. Carlos. Carlos has an Oppo 203 Ultra HD Blu-ray player. He's He had heard so much about region-free Oppo players that he thought it was just a region-free by default. Mm. But it isn't. He tried to play an imported Blu-ray disc and it gave him a region lockout message. So is there a simple way to just unlock his Oppo's region-free capabilities or is there more to it than that? Um, I don't know. Uh, for the Oppos, uh, there is more to it than that. There isn't just like some series of buttons you can press on the remote in the front panel and it becomes region free. Uh, there is like, it's a little chip <laughs> that you plug in <laughs> inside oh, really? of the Oppo. Now, it is really relatively simple. There's no soldering involved. There's no removing something from inside. This is just opening up the chassis and literally plugging in a little chip that they send you. And then there are some remote commands that you use at that point because you do still end up setting what region you're watching, but now you can change it from disk to disk an unlimited number of times. Once That was always the problem I had with, uh, like, if you put a, uh, a region, a different region disk into, like, a computer, it will let mm -hmm. you switch usually. Yes. But there's but a the limited number yeah, of times. The software that you will have a limited number of times. And and hardware players can, can do that, too. Like yeah. the Panasonics, you can reset what region they're in, uh, but there's a limited number of times that they let you do that before they lock you out or, or just lock you to, you know, that region that you've just set and they don't let you change it anymore. So... There is this little chip, costs about 90 bucks. We'll have the link for where you can get it. It's an easy installation. No tools needed other than the screwdriver to take the outer chassis off. Uh, so it's not complicated at all. It's not, you know, dangerous or uh, something literally anybody couldn't do. If you can plug in a USB stick, you can plug this in. So it's not complicated at all that side, but it is about 90 bucks. And then they give you the instructions on f for what buttons you have to press on the remote to change your regions, uh, depending on if you're watching a DVD or a Blu-ray. So it's not too complicated, not crazy expensive and easy to install. Mark asks, is a copper clad aluminum speaker wire okay? He wanted to get some 12 gauge copper speaker wire, but his local store charges $3 a foot, which seemed a bit high. $12 copper clad aluminum speaker wire was way cheaper, so would there be any audible difference using that instead? No. <laughs> yes, almost I just, certainly not. <laughs> I mean, odd, you ask if there's, like, people are like, oh, yeah, you should definitely get the copper, the, 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 the fully oxygen free copper, blah, blah, blah. Okay, all things being equal, like, Mm -hmm. If the prices are the same, which one should you get? You should get the, the oxygen-free copper cable. That's objectively. I, I mean, honestly, objectively. the thing 
I dislike the most about copper clad aluminum is that if you do touch it with your bare hand, like this is you've stripped the jacket off yeah. and the metal is exposed and you touch that metal with your bare hand, you will have this like blackish smudge on your fingers that will like you have to wait until the, the skin on your finger wears off. You cannot wash that off of your hand. Um, that, that is to me the most annoying part about working <coughs> with copper clad aluminum speaker wire uh, is just the mess that it leaves on your hand. So wear gloves uh, when you're terminating or installing those cables Sorry. is about all I would say. Uh, but yeah, like aluminum, like we talked about, I think it was last week when we were talking about, you know, uh, uh, speaker wire gauge and, and resistance and how really the only audible thing that might happen if you get a long enough, thin enough speaker wire yeah. is that some of the high frequencies will start to roll off. Um, the rule of thumb is if you're going from copper to aluminum, same gauge, which this is the case, 12 gauge versus 12 gauge, the aluminum wire, you can go to about two thirds the length. Like if you look up the, the copper charts that we linked to before and saying basically 12 gauge copper there is no chance you'll have any high frequency roll off up to about 50 or 60 feet well about 40 feet take about two-thirds of the 60 foot length and that's about how far aluminum could go before on an audio precision you might start to measure the tiniest bit of high frequency roll off up at 20 kilohertz which you'll never ever hear uh mm -hmm. but i will we'll also just mention since there is that little bit of an annoyance, just the physical annoyance of working with uh, copper clad aluminum. Plus, aluminum is a little bit more brittle, so you can't bend it quite as tightly as copper or as many times before you might get just literal wear and tear on the more brittle aluminum. Uh, you can get very inexpensive uh, 12 gauge copper speaker wire from Mono Price. Uh, you can get it with a white jacket where they charge about 52 cents a foot, or a black jacket where they charge about 62 cents a foot, or a clear jacket where they charge about 70 cents a foot. But all of them considerably less than three dollars a foot uh right. if you're getting that from uh, monoprice you can also get literal broadcast quality cable the uh belden uh speaker wire which is uh what parts express uses you can get that from parts express for about a dollar 20 a foot uh the 12 gauge black jacketed uh speaker wire from them or you can buy it in bulk for about a dollar 10 a foot ever so slightly cheaper from parts express um and, and that would just be belden black jacketed 12 gauge copper uh speaker wire but even less expensive from mono price so cost wise if you're willing to just order it in there isn't really a reason to go with the aluminum speaker wire to be honest but if you're like i need it right now that's and right and you bought it and you're yep. now and you already installed it which a lot Indeed. of people are like ask us questions after that things are done and now they're worried about it yes worry not and also, fine. like, there is speaker wire where one of the leads is copper and the other one is aluminum. And people are like, also does the matter. difference between the two metals mean that the sound is going to be on ballot? No, 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 no. That oh, yeah. Electricity one, really yeah. doesn't care about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Joe, first up, Joe wants to, wanted to say thanks for our compliments about the look of his theater and for discussing his bass trap questions. You're welcome. I'm we mentioned the, the many blue so lights <laughs> from his gear up at the front of the room below his 135-inch projection screen, and indeed, he enjoys having his gear visible as the aesthetics at the front of the room add to the enjoyment, which uh, you'll note are not crown amplifiers <laughs> for that exact reason. Nope. So. <laughs> but sometimes he really wants to get into a movie and be completely immersed with no distractions from any lights, so he came up with an inexpensive solution. He uses commercial floor mats that he cut to size and folded with sharp creases to stand just in front of his gear and block their blue lights. He can quickly and easily slide them into place where they stand on their own and completely block the front panel lights while still allowing air to circulate. He cut a small hole where the IR remote sensor for his pre-pro is and it all works perfectly. That's great. Yep, so got some pictures there where, yeah, it is fully blacked out other than the little bit of light reflecting off of the top of his, um, what, what's the name of that company who does the fans for like AV receivers? Oh, um, a, uh, AC Infinity. Yeah, yeah, he's got he got some of those, and you can see some light reflecting off the screen off the top of those. Oh my goodness, it isn't completely pitch black, uh, but no, no, it uh, it looks very good, and, and the blue lights are covered up by uh, some uh, industrial carpet mats. Speaking of aesthetics at the front of the room, Rob was right in guessing that having both of his subwoofers, the SVS PB2000 Pros, at the front of his room was all about the symmetrical looks. He actually did try having one of them at the back of the room, diagonally across from his front left sub, but the improvement in base uniformity wasn't enough of a difference to overcome the way he felt about the looks. But now that he's decided to add cylinders at the back of his room to act as speaker stands for his surrounds, he decided he likes the idea of using uh, a pair of P PC2000 Pro cylinder subs rather than the GIC Turbo Trap Pro cylinder base traps. That would give him uh, a pair of PB2000 Pros at the front, a pair of PC2000 Pros at the back, <laughs> almost perfectly matched in terms of being directly across the room from one another. So 
<clears throat> he's pretty sure we'll say that it'll uh, that uh, that it will work nicely to address the base in his room, approximately seventeen by twenty six by eight feet. Correct? Mm -hmm. Will he still need to add more passive room treatments and base traps behind his couch? You're not going to like this answer, but yeah, I would still ask more <laughs> more base trapping. <laughs> I mean, again, essentially, in any room in a yeah. house, you you can't have too much <laughs> base trapping. You, there's there's basically you, you could fill the whole room with base trapping and be like, yeah, it's still fine. It's not too much. <laughs> it's still going to be all right. And in your case, what would be going on there is it would be all about the crossover region from the subwoofers to the speakers where passive bass traps could potentially still have a benefit. Uh, but what I will say uh, is that, yeah, by having the subwoofers at the back of the room to match the pair of subwoofers you've got up at the front of the room, uh, you are relying much less on trying to use passive room treatments to go down to frequencies lower than passive room treatments can really effectively yeah. treat. Uh, what you will have now is, you know, active bass correction in a sense, uh, all the way, you know, the entire frequency range, because obviously the PC2000 Pro and the PB2000 Pro have nearly identical performance, uh, for all intents and purposes, identical performance, certainly in extension and output they do. So, this is solving the issue of down into the deep bass better than passive bass traps would, but you still have the region where the bass, uh, where the subwoofers cross over to the speakers. That that is still in existence, and if there are any humps and dips in that frequency range, that is where passive bass traps still do their jobs. So we need um, two different terms for bass. Uh, in on this podcast, I think we need to start uh, talking about two different terms for bass because when people think of bass they think you know at least on this podcast and many av enthusiasts think subwoofers like that's bass. Sure. i'm like no bass starts so much higher than that it so sure it, it almost <laughs> it almost feels like we need to have we can't call it sub bass because it's not under bass we can't call it infrasonics no, it's certainly not that because it's not that but there needs to be deep like bass <laughs> yeah that's, that's what it is we it's need deep, to have like a cutoff we had like like a like a ruler on our website that says this is what we mean when we say bass yeah yeah, no, because you're still going to have the range right up to 200 to 250 yeah. hertz, Which still where the to... subwoofers yeah. are still putting out some sound, but greatly diminished because of the crossover. And right. the speakers are most definitely outputting sound at 200, 250 hertz. And it's in that range where they are both playing, you know, the subwoofers greatly diminished up there, but that is bass. Right? Everything below 500 hertz is bass. And bass traps are really about like, 100 to 500 hertz like that's where they really do their job and you can still have you know uh room things going on so i mean it's almost a case of at the very least you'd want to play sweeps and and hear what's going on in that region but if you want to get more uh granular and scientific about it that is where you start getting into room eq wizard and measuring and seeing what's going on there but like we say you could fill the whole room with bass traps and 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 that is not going to be too many uh so the chances that yet yeah, some bass trapping would still be beneficial is greater than not um but there are the instances where hey you luck out and that crossover works really really well and you don't really need a lot of bass trapping uh to to address a lot of humps and and dips in the crossover region so it's not a guarantee but yeah having the four subwoofers is definitely not a guarantee that you aren't going to need any bass trapping anymore because there's still going to be everything up to 250 hertz and 500 hertz that might still benefit from uh some treatment when it comes to physically connecting his four subs, he actually pre-wired the subwoofer RCA connection in the in one of the rear corners. Mm -hmm. So that's not a problem. And he's using a Marantz AV8805A pre-pro, so it has two independent subwoofer outputs and multi-Q XT32 with sub EQHT. So how should he wire everything? Multiple Y splitters? And should he connect both of his front subs to one of the Marantz subwoofer outputs and both of the rear subs to the other and then just run Odyssey? Will that be enough to calibrate all four subs? Uh, generally speaking, we want you to connect all four of them to the same input and just run it as if it were one subwoofer. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just, that's just multiple Y splitters off of one <laughs> and, and the thing is, the uh, SVS subs, the 2000 Pro series, they have RCA inputs and, and outputs. outputs. Yeah, so yeah. you can daisy chain. So theoretically, you could you could do this connection with no Y splitters at all. Uh, what you could do is run the a single subwoofer output from the Marantz into the first subwoofer at the front of the room, daisy chain from there to the second sub at the front of the room, 
daisy chain from there to uh, the plug that goes to the back of the room. Like, I, I assume he's got an RCA wall plug at the front of the room that connects to the RCA that wall plug silly. at the back of the room. <laughs> it seems like it might be a lot easier just to white. One white yeah, splitter it, at the at the Morantz, one going to the two subs up front, one, two, yes, one going to the two subs in the back. That's right. But, uh, but, like, for the single RCA output that you have at the back of the room, um, you know, you don't have to Y split off of that and feed each of the two subs at the back of the room. You could definitely daisy chain one to the other at the back of the room because I, I think at, behind your couch, that'll probably make more sense. You have a single uh, cable going from the wall to the first sub and then a cable going from the first sub to the second sub at the back of the room. So I'm just saying it doesn't have to be Y splitters because you have the daisy chain uh, connections available on those SVS subs. Uh, but yeah, we, the way that we set up base, we'd have just a single... Uh, subwoofer output of that Marantz being used. And then that same single subwoofer signal is being fed to all four of the subwoofers. That's how we would do it. All right, Nick. We've recently discussed MTM or woofer tweeter, woofer center speaker designs versus center speakers that use a tweeter above a mid-range, uh, dedicated mid-range driver. Uh, mm -hmm. Unlike some other folks online who insist that every MTM center is automatically bad, We've talked about how a speaker designer can adjust the crossover or some other facets of the speaker design to compensate for the horizontal MTM placement of the drivers. So we've said that an MTM center can work just fine if it's designed correctly. And we've also mentioned that how if you're sitting on axis directly in front of the speaker, even the Diapolito array, which is the MTM design, mm -hmm. that is uh, meant to be vertical, simply turned on its side is still probably going to sound just fine unless you move yourself side to side. Mm -hmm. Over at Ascend Acoustics, Dave, the founder and speaker designer, invested in a Kipple measurement system, the same speaker measurement system that Audio Science Review uses. Ascend has a couple MTM speaker design, uh, speaker models, and Dave has posted his own Kipple measure measurements. But for those MTM center speakers, he purposely left out the horizontal contour plots and instead generated estimated in-room off-axis frequency response graphs. This drew the ire of some of the online crowd. No. Yup. <laughs> there was on there was a there there's there's people online that are angry about the thing. No. <laughs> they claim that the contour plots would clearly show the off-axis lobing problems inherent to any and all MTM speaker uh, designs. So by leaving out that particular measurement, Dave must be trying to hide this for shame. Mm -hmm. So Dave took to Ascend's own forums to explain further. First, first of all, I cannot tell you how happy I am that I no longer measure speakers You're right. in my reviews. <laughs> I cannot tell you. And the reason is this. What we are, sure. what you're what you're talking about here, this is exactly why. Because there are it is and this happens in every single hobby. There there's a level of it, it's not it's not the uh, Dunning Kruger effect, but it's very similar where you get just enough knowledge <laughs> but not enough knowledge. You get just enough knowledge right. to recognize that there might be issues, but not enough knowledge to actually interpret the data <laughs> as it was given to you, okay? I have not read this question. I do not know yeah. what he's going to say. I have no idea what's coming, but I will tell I mean, you this you right gotta, now. You gotta love David Fabricant <laughs> because he he doesn't let this type of stuff slide. He's yeah. like, no, no, no. I, like He is really into the science of speaker design. He really knows how to measure speakers. It upset him when Audio Science Review measured some of his speakers on a clipple, and then he was like, I can't replicate their measurement with my measurement equipment, so I'll go get the exact same clipple measurement system they got and... and go at this like into the wee hours of the morning until I'm able to replicate what they did and then I'm going to fix it and I'm going right. to send it back. Like He he didn't let this stuff go. So yeah. this is a man who knows what he's talking about. <laughs> so here's what he says on his forum. Yeah. He fully agrees that the contour plot shows off-axis lobing right in the woofer to tweeter uh, crossover region and it looks ugly. And yes, because it looks ugly, that's why he didn't include it as part of his of, a, of the product page. But, he goes on to explain, when you're seated, say, 20 degrees off axis, it's not as though you only hear the direct 20 degree off axis sound from the speaker. What mm. you hear is a combination of all the sound being output by the speaker, including the room reflections. So, that is why he took the considerable time to generate the estimated in-room off axis frequency response graphs, which still show a dip off axis right in that same ugly region 
as the contour plots, but it doesn't look as scary to people who don't entirely understand what they're looking at in the <laughs> measurement plots. Yes. You dummies. <laughs> okay. I put the you dummies part in there, but believe me, Dave over you, as an acoustic is going, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> dummies. And it's not because it, it, it <sighs> I just, I mean, I'm really into bicycles. I, I like my other love is bicycles. And I spent so much time watching YouTube videos on bicycles who peop, from people who are supposed experts. And mm-hmm. I'm like, nothing you just said is correct. Like, <laughs> nothing you just said is correct. Like, and, and, and then testing different bicycles against each other. I'm like, well, that's not a reliable way of testing things. And, I'm, <laughs> and people in the comments are like, I knew that that, that bike would win. I'm like... So did oh, yeah. they. That's why they did it that way. <laughs> I'm so angry about the whole thing. <laughs> but you know what I'm not doing? Going online and getting mad about it because I've got a life. And I was also, you know, laid up with COVID. But whatever. Anyway, so there's a graph. You can go to our 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 uh, Flickr album Flickr if you're album, not yeah. over on YouTube. And you can see it. And you'll mm-hmm. see what we're talking about here. Here is the, the, the little graph that he showed. And it does have the little dip. And yes, That's it right. is. It right is. in the same range where you, I mean, when they talk about lobing, it's because when you do the contour plot, it <laughs> forms two lobes. Yes. It, it, it also, if you went across, like if you if you plotted this another way, you would get a thing that looks like uh, the pics of a comb. And that's why they call it comb filtering, li- quite literally. That's yeah. why it got co- called comb filtering is because plotted another way, it looks like the pics of a comb home uh but yeah that, that that's what the the problem you can see it it's not like he's denying that you can measure it it shows up right there he knows exactly what they're talking about but he's like yeah when, when you're listening with your two ears in a room to a speaker you aren't hearing like a straight line laser of sound at only that one off axis angle right there's there's sound going all over the room including reflections and clipple so, if you if you spend enough processing time will generate an estimate of the actual in room response it's a weighted response quite sophisticated but yeah that that's what he did Right now over at AV Gadgets, for some reason, my, and maybe because of the new Denons that are coming out, uh, or Yamahas or whoever they are, uh, no, what was the receiver? Sony's? Oh, Sony's that have the dual <laughs> yeah. centers. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. My dual center article is getting a lot of, ah, tra- okay. you know, yeah, a lot yeah, of people yeah. are commenting on like, I've got dual centers and they work great. I'm like, mm. okay. I talked about not needing to do it or not wanting to do it or me not suggesting that you do it. Uh-huh. And it's almost solely because... You don't need to. Like most of the time, yeah. you, you, people aren't like locating their sounds underneath their displays, and putting the second one on sure. top doesn't help that. We, that we don't much. do stereo imaging vertically very well at all with our horizontally oriented human ears, which is what I said. And also, yeah. I talked about comb filtering. Like, well, I don't notice yeah. any of that stuff. I'm like, first of all, you're not going to. But second of all, <laughs> th- those are like reasons why doing this is not necessarily a good idea. Mm-hmm. And the, the real reason to not do it is because people do things like this. Because they think they need to, even if they're mm. not noticing a problem. And if you're mm. not noticing a problem, you don't need to do it. So in here, this is a perfect example. Like, there is a dip. It is like sure. 4 dB at some frequencies. Indeed, yes, yeah. yeah. And that is it, off axis. But. That is off axis. And it's... But you'll notice the the rest of the frequencies outside of that crossover region are almost overlapping, even off axis. Yeah. So it's it's just in that region, you know? Yeah. There you go. It exists. <sighs> So anyways, furthermore, he took some in-room uh, measurements, not just Kipple-generated estimates, and I miss mean, a real-room measurements, not just Kipple-generated estimates. And the real-world measurements line up pretty darn well with estimates and do not look crazy and scary like the contour plot, which you can see here <laughs> again. There's some overlap, and people look at these lines, and they're like, oh my god, they're not right on top of each other. You mm. don't have to be. You don't have these to be. These are off-axis. One of these is on-axis, one of these is 20 degrees off-axis. Yeah. So we would expect some slight differences. So all of this was done with a vertical CMT340 uh, SE2 simply turned on its side. So bottom line, Dave is saying that yes, off-axis lobing shows up in measurements with an MTM center, but it isn't nearly a big, as big of a deal as the scary graphs make it look. This all seems to, get, to go even a step further than what we were saying and indicates that even without a special design or compensation, an MTM center isn't perfectly perfect off-axis, but it really isn't that bad and probably not even audible. What do we think? I wrote it. I don't even know if I published it yet, but I'm going to. I wrote an article that's basically like, 
stop worrying about like these little <laughs> things because literally you could throw any speaker like people are like oh Bose sucks Bose does suck objectively okay <laughs> we have talked about how bad they are but you know what's they're better than literally not having a thing mm. they're better than that and mm -hmm. once you put speakers around you you're like 90 percent of the way there can you get better yes but how much better does it get i don't know about 10 percent. you know most of the time <laughs> you know unless you have an actual physical broken speaker it doesn't really get yes People get so worked up about this, you know. You mm -hmm. do not know, dude, how excited my friend was. And I love him. He is a good friend, and I love him. But you do not know how excited he was to get titanium cleats on his on his on his shoes. Sure. Yeah. Right? These are pieces of metal that weigh nothing that now weigh a little bit less than nothing. Yep. And, and it's measurable. And you it's could measurable. measure it. It's objective. Objectively, it's true. It's there. But they, he's like, oh my god, it makes such a difference. I'm like, oh, I bet. It just, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't make so, a difference. But people believe it and they love it. And yeah, I don't want to take the joy away from cycling from this person. Just like I don't want to take the joy away from uh, uh, buying a thing and loving that thing because of the difference that you subjectively think it makes like mm -hmm. i love that you're excited about your new speakers or your new amp or your new you know I, spikes for your whatever your sure. record player or whatever i love that you're excited about it and if i am talking to you i am not going to try to convince you that it doesn't make a difference oh no, no. but when you go online or you go to <laughs> somebody else and say it makes a huge difference i'm going to say no it doesn't mm -hmm. and that's be and that that's where we are right here this is what dave's saying you're you guys are out here worried about these things that you can see on a graph that you don't truly understand, that you're not and? taking the larger implications of yeah. in the real world and saying to everybody, never buy this speaker. Right. It, it sounds horrible. And the people who own them are going, I don't know, it sounds pretty good to me. Am I deaf? Right. <laughs> and no denial on his part that it can be measured. In fact, he's, yes. he's taken more detailed measurements than almost anybody else does. And he's like, yep, there it is. That's exactly what we're talking and, and in some cases worrying about. Um, what I would say to this is, uh, I, look, I am in agreement with Dave. And yes, if you are sitting in your chair off axis, even with an MTM center, it's not going to be some horrible experience because of the measurable lobing. No. The only thing I will say is I have had the experience where I don't sit perfectly still in my seat all the time and if you are actually kind of like moving your head back and forth or something like that like that is where when i was testing the 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 on wall speakers that i was going through and many of them were just a vertical speaker yeah. turned horizontally that they did nothing else i had to I, i've talked about this i said i would put on pink noise and i would move myself or at least i would move my head side to side and that is when i could pick up the like the pink noise just changed in tone and timbre when i moved my head side to side if i was sitting still whether on axis or off axis i wasn't noticing it but if i was you know, nodding my head side to side if I was swaying back and forth or particularly moving my entire body back and forth while the pink noise was playing the entire time. That's where I could hear. I mean, you can at that point kind of hear those comb picks. It happens as you move yourself side to side. You hear that change in the timbre as you move. So if you're sitting still, <laughs> it's not a problem at all. I kind of like the idea that I can I can even move side to side and not hear any audible artifacts. And that happens when you have the, you know, more ideal off-axis dispersion where you don't have any of that comb filtering or that lobing. So that is my explanation Again. of it. I will say what Rob is describing is an unnatural situation. Sure. You know, in actual content with actual when actually watching TV. Yeah, it's you're not, not a steady hearing pink state noise pink noise. Yeah. Without a yeah, as people do. <laughs> when you're actually watching a movie, you can move your head and you're not gonna know this comb filter. You're not gonna pick it up because the you're sounds are, are changing from moment to moment. It's not steady state pink noise. So yeah. everything Rob just said is invalid as well, as far as I'm concerned. I mean he's not I don't wrong. Disagree with that. He's not wrong in that it exists. This is the yeah. thing that yeah, we yeah, keep yeah, yeah. saying on this podcast. Yes, it exists. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yes, this is this is objectively a better speaker than this one, or this is objectively a better amp than this one, or this is objectively, you know, more power in this external amplifier than in your receiver. Audibly in actual content, <laughs> it doesn't exist because you sure. can't hear it. And I'm yeah. sorry that you can measure it. And I'm sorry that 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 you want to have the best. But I will <laughs> tell you, you will not know this. And if it doesn't, if it's not noticeable, then what does it matter? Sure. Why are you paying See, extra? Where I came from was, you know, I was looking at several different on-wall speakers. <laughs> I, I needed a center that was horizontally oriented, not vertical. And in the case of Revels, the ones that I ended up buying, like all of their... Um, front speakers the the larger side the i think it was the the c uh, c10 and m10 they were all a two and a half way design all right they had a tweeter they had a two mid-range drivers on either side of the tweeter that were playing all the way down to as low as it could and then two more uh woofers outside of those that were playing just the the deeper bass so it was a two and a half way design yeah. now in the center all they did was they moved both of the mid-range drivers to one side of the tweeter and both of the base-only drivers to the other side of the tweeter, right? So instead of it being symmetrical, they changed that two-and-a-half-way arrangement. And when they did that, I could play pink noise and move myself side to side and not hear the comb filtering. And I was like, well, that's all they had to do. They didn't change the price, so I'm going to go with that one. Sure. <laughs> but that's as far as it goes, all right? Sure. If I'm sitting still and listening to actual content, not pink noise, I really don't think I would have even heard the ones where all this they did was This was for your place, though, right? Control. This is for somebody else? No, no, this is for me. Oh, that was for you. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. I thought you were in somebody else's house being weird. Jonathan. <laughs> After 10 years, Jonathan finally convinced his wife to let him upgrade their TV setup in their actual home as they've enjoyed the home theater in their vacation home, uh, but we're still making do with a 42-inch Sharp and a, 90, and a Yamaha YSP-1000 digital sound projector along with an AV-123X sub. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. I think I helped him buy all this. It did happen. You had a review of that X sub and gave it some praise. I mean, honestly, there were <coughs> AV-123 speakers that were pretty darn good. They had yeah. those ring radiators. They may or may not have been stolen I've, from other companies, but yes, they were pretty good. <laughs> yeah. He has now installed a 65-inch LG C2 OLED along with a Vizio Elevate soundbar. He fully admits... He'd just like to hear some approval from us. A full-fledged mm -hmm. system with an AV receiver and wires and separate speakers was still a no-go from his wife. Rob said how he only likes one Vizio $500 sound bar because anything <laughs> less expensive is kind of crappy. Anything more expensive doesn't offer great value. But we've said how... <coughs> Excuse me. Let me take a sip here real quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah, we've said... Uh, and we said how some of the more expensive sound bars do sound quite good, but they just seem overpriced. Yeah. Well, he got the Vizio Elevate on sale and honestly sounds darn good. No, not as good as a full system in their vacation home, but better than the Yamaha replaced. The utmost effects are actually quite convincing, and most of all, his wife is okay with it. Furthermore, <laughs> He was very impressed with how the LG OLED recognized every device that was plugged into it, automatically configured itself via an HDMI CC to control everything he needed just using the TV's remote. Even their lights can be controlled using LG's ThinQ app. Whatever the heck that is. Think. Think, think app. Think. And, even and, even thin LG Q. people say ThinQ, which is so silly because it was supposed to be Think, but it's spelled ThinQ. Anyways, thin it's a spelled ThinQ. So <laughs> that had him thinking he could ditch his harmony. More on that in a bit. So all in all, does this get a thumbs up from maybe Rant? Or since it's still new, should anything be getting returned or exchanged for something else? Um, what do you say about subwoofers in this? I missed it. Or I, I mean, the, the Vizio Elevate comes with a you know a wireless sub, as, ah, as okay. so many of the subwoofers uh, uh, soundbars do. So there isn't really an You lost there. me at, uh, it sounds good to him. So as soon as you say that. <laughs> and then wife I'm, approved. Oh, yeah, those two. <laughs> once you've got those things down, I don't care what you say after that. Like, I'm not going to try to convince you that you should buy something different or better. Or bigger. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the, <laughs> the Vizio P series Elevate soundbar, the Samsung, uh, you know, 9.1.4 systems that they have in that, those are the, those are the soundbars that I do think sound pretty darn good. But because they're priced at normally, you know, I, I think the Elevate, the lowest it usually gets at regular prices, $1,000. And then the Samsungs are like $1,500, $1,400, $1,500, that type of thing. That's up into the price range of like, <laughs> like I'm yeah. thinking I'd rather just get a receiver and speakers. But when the receiver and speakers mean your wife isn't going to have be okay with those being in the living room and the $1,000 sound bar, she is okay being in the living room. I'm like, yeah, they sound pretty darn good. I think 
you know, I'd rather spend that same amount of money on a different system. But if I'm not like it's not okay with the other members of my house to have that other system, I'm gonna get the Vizio Elevate soundbar. I do think it's a good sounding soundbar. So yeah, the only I thing give I you would, a thumbs up. Yeah, the only thing I would say is that uh, I am very strongly leaning towards actual like self-powered speakers from Kef and some of the other sure. companies that are out there. But that would almost but, certainly be just a pair. That would right. It would just be a pair yeah. at the same price point. Um, yeah. You could use your old sub with it, probably, if you got the right yep. ones. Oh, we yeah. talked about this before. Yeah. Um, but if it's not going to be wipe approved, who cares? If you got Indeed. something, that's that's the most important part. Yeah. So, I mean, the only thing that I <laughs> would consider, uh, if you're willing to give a try to the $500 Vizio sound bar that, right. that I do recommend and just see is, like, is is the Elevate yeah, uh, four or five hundred dollars better than than right. that one. So the the one I like is the M five one two dash H six. Normally priced at five hundred, and it was on sale for four hundred just recently. I'm not sure if it still is as of the time that you're hearing this. Uh, but I mean, that would be about the only thing I would consider. However, if you're already set up, it'd be a hassle to take it down and change something else. Uh, I do think that the Elevate is a good sounding soundbar. It's just normally I would take $1,000 and spending on something else, but the form factor is really nice. It looks slick. It's got the cool little thing where where it's at most time, it actually like motorizes the little upward firing speakers on the side and does a cool little rotating thing. So it just has a cool factor to it. Yeah. And I'm a-okay with all of that. So you thought the new uh, LG being able to control everything with this remote was impressive, but two things went quickly uh, two things quickly went wrong. Within mm. two days, something with the CEC controls went haywire. <laughs> <coughs> I am sorry. Shocking. I, I, my um, my throat is just like ah. scratchy all of a sudden. Mm. And the only way to get things working again was to fully unplug the TV and the factory reset didn't work. So yes, he had to drain the capacitors and everything. Yeah. <laughs> but that might not have been entirely CEC's fault because he did try to reintegrate his Harmony hub back into the system. Why? Because his wife is already used to the Harmony and she's not a fan of having of learning how of learning how to use LG's remote with this on-screen pointer that you have to move around like a Wii remote. I hate that too. I'm with your wife. <laughs> I mean, you don't entirely have to. You you can just use the uh, you know the the up down left right buttons and the OK button. But every time you pick up the remote. Uh, it, it, it does bring up the little Wii remote type pointer thing that's going annoying. on with that. So, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, a, a little bit of a, a thing to get used to with those LG remotes for sure. We so if they're going to continue, <laughs> okay, I, you're, I, I, I may be losing my internet connection completely. Yep, it was going bad me. there for a bit. We're okay, I think. So if they're going to continue using the Harmony, how can he avoid further HMI CC mishaps? Uh, in order for his Vizio uh, Elevate soundbar to continue working, he has to leave CEC turned on since it is required for using the eARC port. Plus, he likes the LG's remote and some of the built-in apps, uh, what, what some of the built-in apps have to offer. They use an NVIDIA Shield and a couple of their sources. What's going to result in the fewest headaches? I mean, I'd get, I mean there's got to be some way just to use the Harmony solely i don't yeah yeah i would i would say for you jonathan since you're more comfortable using one remote or the other but your wife really only wants to use the harmony remote that she's already used to i would recommend putting the lg remote away <laughs> even though you might find some things useful uh on it um just the fact that you are almost certainly going to end up with future clashes between the state that your harmony remote thinks your devices are in versus the power on state or the input state or whatever that they're actually in because of some CEC command that you did with the LG zone remote. I would make sure that both you and your wife are only ever using the harmony remote and not relying on CEC. Yes, you've got to leave CEC turned on for the television and for the sound bar, because that needs to keep working. But I would turn CEC in all of your source devices off. And and that that is the approach that I would take with it. So I would focus on just using the Harmony as though CEC is not present. <laughs> I would take any of the power on off commands that are, are going between the television and the sound bar. I would turn those off because uh, you can still have eARC going without the CEC power commands being turned on in the LG OLED. So I would do as little with CEC as possible. I would turn as much of it off as you're able to uh, and just rely on the Harmony. That that would be, to me, the way to have the fewest headaches going forward. And just 
unfortunately say goodbye to the couple of features that that might only be easily accessible through the LG remote because you were doing okay without them before and now you're like hey it's a cool thing it can do I wouldn't mind continuing to use it but if it's going to result in clashes with your Harmony remote just I would put it out of your mind and act as if they don't exist okay I <laughs> I don't know I if don't you know read how the, much the message in chat there, but I... No, <laughs> sorry. I can barely understand you. I'm getting like every third okay. syllable. So Wonderful. I'm going to assume that you're done talking at this point. I will read the next question and we'll see if we can get much further on this. But I just, I have a feeling my internet's about to crap out. So we'll try. Blake, <clears throat> excuse me. Blake has a covered deck just outside his basement air entrance to his house. He's got a pair of Klipsch outdoor speakers out there being powered by a Denon S650H receiver. At the moment, he's only ever used his phone to wirelessly connect and play streaming music from his outdoor setup. Inside the basement, he has 7.2.4 Atmos setup being powered by Marantz SR6012 receiver with a little Class D amp. For the last two overhead channels, he's got it connected to an Epson 5040 UB projector and several HDMI sources. He wants to add a TV outside. It would be under the covered section and attached to the side of the house with a full motion wall mount and almost certainly a 55 inch size. So we've got a picture that you can look on the Flickr album if you're not following us along on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Does he need to pay the considerably higher price of an outdoor TV or could he just get something relatively inexpensive like a TCL and not worry about it too much? He's in Southern Indiana, so cold weather is more of a concern. What do we think? <clears throat> I think I'd get something that I could take in and out and I would... Um, just hook it and unhook it and then you know or wheel it out there i mean something like <laughs> that yeah, uh, I don't disagree with that. Uh, the other thing you could do if you really are planning to leave it out there, I mean, at least it is partially undercover, so it's not having rain coming directly down on it, but that's a pretty open patio there. So if there's any wind plus rain or wind plus snow, uh, that's definitely going to be able to make its way to the television uh, uh, sometimes. So what they have are just uh, all-weather covers for television. I mean, they're widely available. They're like 70 80 bucks uh at the most you can just pick them up at best buy or order it from amazon and i would absolutely get at least one of the covers and just make sure that the the, the television is covered with that um you know when you're not using it if you aren't planning to bring it in and out but i don't think i would go getting you know one of the very expensive outdoor weather televisions uh, i don't think that's what you need in this situation i think yeah you get a, a cheap tv that you're not going to be worried about if you do lose it and then have a proper all-weather cover for it if you aren't willing to take it in and out of the house all right i, I heard something about a cover so yep. <laughs> i'm not sure i'm not sure what in that, that he, rob said i will say that here in florida uh, and in fact, just dealing with moisture in general, <coughs> coverts are good for keeping moisture off from the outside when it comes in, but it mm -hmm. also, they're very good for keeping moisture in once it gets there. Mm -hmm. So be very careful about that because, uh, you could take that cover off and then find that you've completely destroyed your gear. Mm. He'd like to be able to show any of his home theater sources on the outdoor TV. How would he go about connecting everything so it would work? His basement theater has a drop tile ceiling, so running the wires isn't a big problem. Would he still use his Denon receiver at all? He doesn't uh, have any more speaker outputs or available in his Marantz. They're all being, being used by the main theater, so something separate would still need to power his pair of outdoor speakers. What gets connected to that? Um, I'm not sure about that Marantz, whether or not it has a second uh, HDMI output. But if it did, that would be the easiest way to do that for like a zone two or something. And then yeah. any HDMI input that was going in could be sent out to the other uh, receiver that you have pa currently powering your um, outdoor speakers anyways. And then uh, that would be the easiest solution there. Yeah, the uh, the Marantz SR6012 <coughs> actually has three HDMI outputs, uh, one of which is a dedicated zone two. HDMI output and that is definitely what you want want to use you'd want to send the zone 2 HDMI output of your Marantz to just a regular HDMI input on your Denon uh, S650. So I would continue using it for sure. Uh, one of the main reasons I'd want to use that, aside from just it's a single uh, cable that you have to run and not terribly complicated, is that if you try to send audio uh, as zone 2 from the Marantz, 
uh, that is an old enough model in the SR6012 that your main zone would now become limited to stereo audio, just like the zone two output. Like I'm assuming he's going to be playing the same game, both in the theater and out on the deck. So you wouldn't want to be limited to two channel audio in the main zone at the same time as out on the deck, uh, which would be what would happen if you just use like the zone two pre outs on the Marantz to feed an audio only signal. But if you use the zone two HDMI, uh, it's just sending the entire signal, audio and video, all the way through uh, out of that zone two HDMI output. So that is definitely the way. So yeah, it's a zone two HDMI connection out of your Marantz into a regular HDMI input of your Denon and then the Denon's HDMI output to the TV that's out on the patio. So really quite a simple uh, connection path and uh, don't really have to buy anything besides one extra long HDMI cable. Great. All right, that's it. Because I want to deal with uh, Julian's question, uh, which I know is the next question, but I, I want to be able to do it in such a way that you and I can have a conversation and not um, me just listening to robot raw <laughs> that's too not bad yeah I mean... anything that you're saying so <clears throat> let's uh let's just cut the podcast there and we will pick it up next week and we have julian left and who else uh we have julian left we have dan <coughs> uh let's see dan's is pretty long so i'm scrolling down past it here and then we get to joe and daz and then i just wanted to let um one more person know who wrote in on Monday, which was Henry, that I did receive your uh, email. So we will get to that later. Sorry that we're cutting things short this week, but uh, technical issues plus Tom being sick means where the last 10 minutes will get tacked on to the beginning of next week's podcast. No idea what you just said. All right. Mm. We're going to thank our listeners of the week. We're going to thank Jonathan and Stephen to go for going to abrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and sending us PayPal donation, as well as our 141 patrons over at patreon.com, including Julian. Thank you to all of you. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Stephen, for the PayPal donations. And patreon.com slash Podcast is the place to go to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. So a big thanks to our 141 patrons over there, including Julian. Thank you to Joe for sending uh, photos for me to use on NavyGadgets.com. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And lastly, thanks uh, to those who sent notes of gratitude uh, from Anders, Greg, Jonathan, Steve, Julian, Dan, and Das. Thank you for thanking us. Yeah, I'll say the names one more time. Anders, Greg, Jonathan, Steve, Julian, Dan, and Daz. Thank you all very much for the notes of gratitude to us for keeping the podcast going. Big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. For A.B. Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.